the Nix package manager. It's spelled N-I-X. Um, uh, it does a lot of different things. Uh, Nix is the name of many tools within the Nix ecosystem. So this is about specifically the package manager. Uh, and it also really only touches the, the surface. Like there's a, there's, there's a very complicated and deep tool with many features. Um, and I am not an expert. I signed up to do this talk primarily so that I would encourage myself to learn how to use the tool uh, with the risk of embarrassment uh, if I do not. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll see if I do embarrass myself. Um, all right, so Nix is a package manager. Um, and uh, quickly, let's just run through what we use package managers for. So why is it, like, why do you use your systems package manager? I'm fielding questions from the audience here. I mean, obviously to install pack, install products and packages and stuff like that. Right, but why install them through your package manager as opposed to just getting them from the internet? Or getting them from somewhere else? Or using a different package manager? So you can share dependencies across different projects that you've installed. Right, yeah, shared dependencies. Not waiting for it to compile. Not waiting for, oh, waiting for it to compile. Yeah, so you don't have to build it from source. So you can have binary distribution. Because it's easier to type app get yeah. install foo than chase down a website. For sure, yeah. And it's more secure, right? You don't, I mean, if you're getting it from a website, who knows if you're, you have to really be certain you're on google.com and not goog capital I E dot com. Uh, and you got to make sure your browser is secure, things like that. Um, you can also trust probably that your repositories are less likely to be compromised than some website, although that may not always be true. Um, uh, uh, you mentioned shared dependencies. Uh, there's also, of course, the problem of dependency hell, where uh, uh, it may be, maybe I have circular dependencies. Maybe I have different packages that require different versions of the same library, and those are incompatible and can't be installed on the same system. Uh, and so your package manager handles all those conflicts for you, uh, if it's a good one. So um, those are those are the kind of things that, that a package manager can solve for you. Uh, but there are a lot of situations in which it would be nice to be able to use a package manager, but uh, they don't really work out. So uh, I don't know if you guys can think of any, any of those where you have to, when do you have to resort to not using your systems package manager? Oh, you and, uh, for, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I was going to say when the version um, that's in the distribution isn't the one you want for whatever reason. Yeah, that's a big one. You want software that's old or new? The uh, key mm -hmm. a moment ago was uh, if two packages have incompatible version dependency hell prerequisites, you may have to bring one of them in through a snap or flat pack or something. Yeah. Right. Um, so those are more, um, those are, uh, formats that encompass, you know, they'll, they'll package up with the package a little, uh, I'm not exactly sure how snap works, but I think flat pack works by basically duplicating a lot of the environment into the package. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Um, and so it, it dodges the problem of incompatible dependencies because it sticks all the dependencies in with each package. Does that sound right? <laughs> Yes, and in, in modern systems where we have lots of RAM, this uh, works reasonably well. Uh, in the early days, the, the point of a shared library was you'd have only one read-only copy in RAM, um, as well as only one copy installed. Right, and shared libraries also uh, come with some security benefits, because I can update a shared library and 
uh, fix a bug. And I've now fixed that bug in all of the things that depend on that library at runtime. Uh, but if it's a statically linked library, then I've got to update every single package that uses that library. So it's not yeah. just memory usage. Um, uh, Another issue with package managers is uh, web applications have not agreed on how to integrate with the host OSs that they run on. Yeah. So it's like every every web application is its own adventure of how to integrate it with whatever you happen to have installed. And as because of that, the Debian system, the Red Hat Fedora system, uh, they all th there's they all have like you know a couple dozen web applications packaged, and then they just kind of gave up after that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that's a really big problem with certain languages that have uh, very different packaging philosophies, uh, like you know big JavaScript web applications for which you might need five hundred different npm modules installed, um, and uh, they need to be pegged at specific versions, and it's, they're all really obscure, and it's unlikely that your system has packaged any of them um, for sure. Yeah. Python has a similar problem. Um, so like this is Arch Linux. Arch packages a bunch of Python modules, but there's too many Python modules. And anyone can make a Python module. And people who write a lot of Python tend to just pull in dependencies willy-nilly. And uh, it leads to a lot of problems uh, where I'll, I'll try to run something. And it, it requires some really weird, obscure Python module uh, that no one has updated in forever and isn't packaged in my repository. And then I've got to, you know, call out to pip. And then you got to deal with virtual environments. I might only want this to be installed for this project, or I might want it installed for my user with pip, or I might want it installed system wide through pip. Um, so yeah, uh, when you're using languages that don't integrate nicely with your system, uh, like JavaScript and Python, you're, you're forced to not use your systems package manager most of the time. Um, anybody, can anyone think of anything more? I would say there's a, it's really, I only have like a couple more. Um, if we want software that's really weird and obscure, of course, it's not going to be packaged. Uh, and if we want software that really needs to run exactly the same on my computer as it does on your computer, then I'm more likely to turn to something like containers than I am to just get that software through my package manager. Because um, if, if it's really important that I have something reproducible, I actually don't want to rely on my systems package manager because it might make lots of assumptions that I'm on a particular distribution of Linux. Um, so it's in, in those situations, it's often better to turn to something with, uh, you know, like to VMs or containers or, um, you know, some kind of reproducible environment. Um, all right, so that's uh, some motivation. And now we get to Nix. So Nix is a package manager that looks to solve a lot of the problems we just listed. Um, there's also an OS called Nix OS that uses Nix as its system package manager. And uh, it allows you to, it does a lot more things than manage packages when you're using Nix on, on Nix OS. There's also the Nix language, which is a functional programming language that you use to create uh, Nix packages and also to uh, specify all kinds of configuration options within Nix OS. Uh, and we're not going to really talk about Nix OS or the Nix language for the rest of this talk. This is purely about the package manager. And a future talk may be about one of those other two things. Um, OK, so uh, the first thing you probably want to uh, know is how to set up the Nix package manager. Um, so uh, Nix is packaged for a lot of different uh, Linux distributions in their native package manager. So here on Arch. I can just uh, go get um, Nix, and uh, I mean I can I can show you here. It's around. It's in here somewhere. Nix, right here. There is Nix. 
Um, so you can just get it from your systems package manager. Uh, you can also get it by, um, uh, they have a, a shell script on their website that you can curl and pipe directly into your shell. That's what they recommend. Um, that's kind of a, I don't know if I recommend curling anything directly into your shell, but um, it's your computer, uh, do what you want. Um, and once you run that script or you install it uh, from your package manager, there's a couple more things you'd have to do. Um, uh, the first thing is you need to uh, ensure that your user is in the uh, Nix users group. So uh, user mod dash, um, dash append dash G Nix users, and then your username. And uh, that will add you here. I'm, I didn't actually type sudo, but I already am in the group. You can see here I am Nix users. Uh, so make sure your user is in Nix users. And then you want to start the Nix daemon. So uh, on a systemd system, that's going to be systemctl uh, enable dash dash now Nix daemon dot service. Uh, and I'm not going to authenticate here, but um, if you look, it is running. Um, OK, so you've started up the daemon. You've added yourself to the group. You've installed Nix. Uh, then you need to tell Nix which channel to use. So this is kind of the first place where Nix starts getting interesting. Um, so normally, if I'm running, and I could be wrong about this, so please feel free to uh, interrupt me if I say something incorrect. Um, at least on, on Arch, if I install Arch, the version of the Arch repositories that I have access to is just the current version of the Arch repositories, and there's only one. That's because Arch is a rolling release distribution. On a, on a fixed release distribution like Ubuntu, then the version of the repositories I have access to is just tied to whatever release of that distribution I'm on. So if I'm on Ubuntu 2004, then I get access to the Ubuntu 2004 repositories. Uh, is that right? Can you, can you also access the Ubuntu 1804 repositories on 2004? Or the 2204 repositories? Only in a container. You, you can't install old packages on the new OS in Ubuntu. Okay. Some some of them work, but generally it's not a good idea. Yeah, I've I have only I've done it before by just downloading debs from various places. Uh, but uh, it's a big pain certainly to get it to get it going, and it's not something that is officially supported. Um, that was my understanding too, so I'm glad I didn't say something wrong. Um, okay, so uh, Nix allows you to choose which channel of Nix packages you want to uh, subscribe to. And you can, you, can, uh, you can have many channels concurrently set up. So I can say I want to have the unstable channel, which means I have access to the latest versions of packages uh, in the repositories. I can also go, uh, the furthest back I've got working is 2015. Uh, Nix has only been around since I think 20. The oldest repositories I could see were from 2013. I think the tool is actually much older than that. It started as somebody's like grad school project in the early 2000s, um, but it's only it's really been picking up steam recently. Anyway, I was able to get the 2015 September uh, repositories working and everything between then and now. Um, so uh, anyway, getting back to where we just in the setup process uh, to enable a channel, what you want to do is you want to say next channel dash dash add and then just give the URL of the channel and give it a name. So here we're going to go to nixos.org slash channels slash nix packages unstable. Uh, and we're going to call that nix packages. Now, by default, the name of your default channel is nix packages, spelled like that. So if I actually left this off, it would still name the channel nix packages. Um, now, I already have this channel installed, so I'm not going to actually run this command. But this would be the command you would run to add the unstable channel. If you wanted to add a different channel, then for whatever reason, instead of being called Nix packages and then the version, it's actually called Nix OS and then the version. Uh, and then you'd have to give it a name. So here we could go install the 1509 repositories and uh, call it that. Now, let me just make sure. I'm just going to check quickly to see if I actually already have that one installed. So Nix uh, channel dash dash list looks out the channels I have. And yes, I have, I do have that channel. So I'm not going to go install it again. Um, but if I wanted to get a different channel, if I wanted to get um, uh, 
for example, uh, 2205. So that's only a few months ago. Um, just give it a name. Nix package is 2205. Nix channel add. So now I've added the channel, and then you just do Nix channel update. And now if I do Nix channel list, I now have three channels. Okay, so I can have concurrently uh, new and old versions of packages installed. Um, and uh, I can select from what time period I, uh, I would like to have those packages come. All right, so that's the first kind of uh, interesting thing about Nix that we've seen. Um, all right, so once you've done that, log out and log back in, uh, and then you should have access to the like main package management features of Nix. So I've already done that, so I'm not going to do that again. But uh, if you if you are following along in your mind, that's uh, that's what you would do. Would be log out and log back in. All right. So now when you want to use the normal package management features of Nix, you use the Nix env command. So so far we've seen uh, Nix channel, uh, which is for managing channels, uh, and Nix env, which is for the kind of more traditional package manager um, operations. So uh, Nix env uh, dash dash install is for installing a package. Um, so if you then you can say dash a if you want to specify which channel it's from. Otherwise, it will just use your default Nix packages channel, which for me is unstable. Um, so I can and you can also say Nix packages dash or Nix env dash i uh, and dash i a would be the kind of traditional way to see it. So if I want to go install a package uh, like on Arch, they no longer package Python 2. So Python is Python 3. Uh, and if I want to try to find Python 2, uh, it's not there. <laughs> this is the only thing they have that even has the string Python 2 in the description. Uh, so there's no Python 2 on Arch, but there is on Nix. So I can go install uh, Nix packages.python2. And here, what I'm specifying is the channel. So I'm saying it's from my Nix packages channel, which is default. But I could also specify a different channel, like Nix packages uh, 2205, or is 0522. I think it's 2205. Uh, and this would get the, the version uh, from that uh, channel. So we're going to get the default version of Python 2. And there you go. So uh, it goes and grabs the package and then installs it. And it does not install it to the normal place where a normal package manager would stick uh, this binary. And we're, we're going to see that later. Um, so uh, if you want to remove a package, you just use uninstall. And then you, again, just give the name of the package. I don't remember if you have to say the channel here, but no, I don't think you have to write. It's called Python. Sometimes the name that you use to install it is not actually the name of the, the package. It's one of the confusing UI elements here. Um, maybe you don't have to say the channel. Yeah. So yeah, you don't have to say the channel when you're uninstalling. Uh, Okay, <laughs> so here you uninstall with dash dash uninstall. You can also use dash e uh, to uninstall. Uh, then there is uh, another common operation would be you want to list out all your packages. That would be nix env dash q. And here I have nothing installed because all I did was install Python 2 and then get rid of it. Um, but if I were to go uh, install Python 2 again, this would list out uh, the package and the channel that it's from. And then to search for a package, you use um, QAP. And then you can search by regular expression. So I can look for all packages containing Python. And uh, uh, it'll take a long time because there's 80,000 packages. And uh, lots of them have the string Python in them. Uh, because lots of Python packages are packaged uh, for Nix. So you can avoid having to use pip so much uh, and just get all your Python packages through pip or through Nix if they're supported. Anyway, here's the big list of all the Python, all the things that have Python in them. So you've got um, uh, this looks like some common Lisp Python interfaces, some Emacs stuff, uh, and then stuff for PyPy. You can see there's lots and lots and lots of these. Uh, here's just the Python two packages. And then way below, now we have the Python 3.10 packages. Um, there's a whole lot of this stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's a really, really, really giant package repository. Um, so there's just a whole ton of stuff in here. Um, 
And being able to search by regex, I think is pretty cool. Um, Cause as it is right now, I, I normally would search for a package like this and then, you know, pipe it into grep and, you know, pipe that into another grep potentially. Uh, and that's kind of a pain. It's nice that the package manager does all that for me. Um, so those are all the basic package management operations that you'd expect. Uh, and here's something else that's pretty cool. So remember, we what we've done so far really is install Python 2 and then uninstall it. And at every install and uninstall, Nix creates a, a generation for the packages installed on your system. So I can roll back to any intermediate state of the packages that I've ever had on my system. Uh, so unless I like explicitly delete those generations. So here I can say nix env dash dash list generations to see what my generations are. So I have three right now because I actually cleared them out before I started this. So the first was the state of my machine before this talk. The second is the state of my machine once I installed Python 2. And the third, which is the current, uh, is the state of my machine now that I have once again uninstalled Python 2. So I can do uh, nix env dash dash rollback and return to the previous state of the machine. And now if I try Python 2, it works. But if I were to nix env uh, uh, switch generation back to where I started, and I try running Python 2 again, it's no longer installed, or it's no longer visible to me. So uh, each of these install and uninstall operations, uh, they're not you shouldn't feel like they're set in stone because if you make a mistake and you end up with a weird configuration of your system, you can always roll back to the exact package state that you had earlier, uh, which is really, really cool. <laughs> um, now, of course, after a long time, generations can start to take up space because you keep around packages that you've uninstalled. So you can prune off old generations. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I can't remember the exact command. It might be remove and remove generations uh, 28, 29. I think we'll delete the, maybe it was remove generation. Delete generation, it's something like that. Um, well, there's a command that allows you to remove old generations. Um, at this point, like it's not really all that important. I might want to roll back, but if it's been like a month, you probably don't want to roll back a full month. So you might uh, do well just pruning off some of those older generations. Uh, all right, so that's generations. Those are uh, pretty cool, and they allow you to um, to roll back to the exact state that your system was in uh, in terms of the the packages installed uh, and go back and forth between those states. Um, all right, so in the state that I'm in now. If I look, I have nothing, I have no Nix packages installed. And let's say I want to keep it that way. I don't want to install Python 2 for real. I just want to use it and for like one quick thing and then be done. So let's say I have, uh, um, here I have this old script and what's in it? Well, it's a print statement that's a print statement. So this will only work in Python 2. If I try to run it through Python 3, uh, it tells me that I don't have parentheses. In Python 2, you didn't need those parentheses. So let's say I just want to run this one script in Python 2, but I don't actually really want to have Python 2 installed on my system. Well, I can do nix shell dash dash packages Python 2. And then it'll just drop me into a shell that has the packages I asked for installed and uh, no other uh, nix packages. So now I can run that old script and it works, right? It prints the thing that it's supposed to. And when I close this and I ask, oh, how, what packages do I have? I still don't have Python 2. So I can go and grab like a whole bunch of packages and I can even specify what channel they come from. So I can, I can uh, create a reproducible build environment this way by um, saying, I need these 10 packages from this particular channel from three years ago. And I can send you a script that, uh, that um, you know gets exactly the same packages from exactly the same place, enters uh, a shell that has exactly those same resources, and then goes and does whatever I wanted to do 
all of this without duplicating the file system like containers would. Um, I don't need to run multiple user lands. I can just have my systems user land with all the specific pieces I need replaced uh, with Nix. Um, all right, so let's now uh, kind of dig in here. I'm going to install a couple of packages. Um, so we're going to get uh, wget and wget2 and curl and uh, chromium. And uh, I don't know if you guys have any suggestions here. Um, anything else you guys want me to install? <laughs> Nothing malicious? I like, that. I like using ZimWiki for taking notes. ZimWiki? All right, I've never heard of that. Let me search to see what the package is called. Uh, so nixenv-qap, uh, that's a Z-I-M. Dot star wiki. Um, let's see what that. I'm not sure if wiki is in the uh, name of the package. Oh, it might just be zip, zim. Zim, yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at all the things that have zim in there anywhere. Maybe I should just search for zim. <laughs> I'm getting uh, too fancy with all the, the ability to do regex searching. It's just too appealing. Uh, I can be slow waiting for the searches. <laughs> um, OK, so here, uh, here, OK, we've got Zim 0 0.63 in the Nix Packages 1509 channel. We've got uh, 0 0.74.2 in 2205. And we've got 74.3 in uh, Unstable. So let's just get the one from Unstable. So we'll uh, do nixenv-ia nixpackages.zim. Uh, so here, um, I'm going to get rid of the A here, because uh, when you specify the A, that's where you would say which channel each one is from. And if you want them to come from the default channel, you can just get rid of the A. I don't have to think about that. So here, I'm asking for wget, wget2, curl, chromium, and zim. And you just wait uh, while it gets all those things. <laughs> um, Great. Okay. Cool. So it's gotten all the things. Let me scroll up through this. Um, you can see it's uh, it's getting these packages, and then uh, you see it's got these gigantic. It's got these paths uh, slash nix slash store slash a bunch of junk dash the name of a package and a version. So. Uh, this is really where all your packages go with Nix. They go into the Nix store, which is usually at slash Nix slash store. Um, and they're stored in a really interesting way. So instead of trusting that a version number is necessarily unique, uh, it might be, right, if I'm a really uh, neglectful package manager, I might decide to make uh, you know, my package 3.0, and then I might make another version of my package also called 3.0. So it's probably not smart to trust that the developer of the package actually uh, has a sane versioning scheme for their system. They might reset the versioning scheme. They might do who knows what. So true, uh, true, true. Yeah. So the way that Nix gets around this is they, in addition to having the uh, the version name, uh, the version in the package name in the Nix store and the name of the package. Uh, and also potentially more information about it, like if it's the binary version or the development version. Uh, they also stick a big giant hash of the entire dependency graph of that package uh, in the uh, package name in the Nix store. That way, I won't have the same, I won't have a name conflict unless two packages have the same set of dependencies and the same name and the same version, which I suppose is possible, uh, but uh, I think pretty unlikely. Um, so uh, yeah, let's let's here you can see I've got all these things in the Nix store that got installed as dependencies of other packages, um, and uh, dependencies just like a normal package manager are shared between packages if necessary, but they're not in my path. So like this package by default 
it's been, it has its own bin directory that is opaque to me right now sitting here and will only be visible to my package when I run it. So <laughs> uh, to whatever depends on that, whatever depends on this package, we'll be able to see it. But this isn't just globally accessible to me right now. This allows me to have multiple packages that have conflicting dependencies because uh, the dependencies aren't globally accessible. Uh, but if it can be shared, then they are. So I don't have the problem of flat packs where all the binaries get really big. And I also don't have the problem of normal packages where I don't have giant binaries, but I also might have conflicting libraries. Um, so this dodges both of those problems. So um, is that what the server is serving, these <clears throat> binaries from the next door? Uh, so yeah, it's serving... The server has a big giant repository of all these binaries. Some of them are binaries. Some of them uh, are source that your computer will build. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just serving these packages to you and your computer is sticking them in the next door. So here I can look at my own next door uh, and it's just completely full of stuff. Now these DRV files are actually, you can think of them as little scripts that contain the instructions for how to make this package. Um, and they're written in the Nix language. Um, and I don't really know exactly how they work. Um, there's also various like patches in here that will get automatically applied to certain things that don't quite work with, um, with other things in the Nix store. And then uh, the directories are the packages you have installed. Uh, now they could be packages you've deliberately installed. They could be dependents of other, or dependencies of other things. So, um, uh, you know, the Nix store, it's, it's very busy. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here, um, but you don't have full access to all the Nix store at any given moment. What I have, I just have these packages installed. All I have is Chromium, curl, wget, wget2, and zim. So where are those? If I do wget uh, zim, this directory does get in my path. So when I install Nix, it changes my... Uh, slash etc slash profile uh or it, i think it it doesn't change my profile it sticks a script into slash etc slash profile.d so that will run when i log in um that adds this to my path so uh here in my next profile uh in the bin directory you can see there's symbolic links for all the packages i just installed and these link into the nix store so the whole Nix store is not accessible to me, just the packages I installed deliberately, not the ones that got installed as dependencies of other things. Uh, so now I can go run. Uh, so this is, if I were to run curl right now, it'd probably be my system's curl, but I think I can check. Uh, yeah, so I'd have to, now if I try it. Yeah, okay, now it's pointing to my, my actual curl. Uh, and you can see I've got two different versions installed. So I can do curl version, this is the curl that I got from Nix. And if I did user bin curl version, this is the curl I got from Arch. Turns out they're the same version, but they were uh, built with slightly different versions of libraries. So this has zlib1.2.13, this has zlib1.2.12. Uh, so maybe not the, the greatest example, but uh, you, can have you can have the same thing installed with your systems package manager and with Nix without having uh, you know, with, with access to both. Uh, and then you can install multiple versions uh, with Nix. Another thing I haven't yet mentioned that is an important thing to note is that Nix works completely on Mac OS. So you can have exactly the same set of packages installed on uh, Linux and Mac OS, assuming that a version uh, exists. So you don't have to have something that's packaged both for Brew and for your systems package manager. You can just have something packaged for Nix and it will then be packaged on, on both Mac OS and uh, Linux. Also, Brew, I've had lots of bad experiences with Brew. It really steps on uh, certain directories in the Mac OS system that I uh, don't want it to. Um, so it's nice to have something that just sticks everything in its own set of directories, and then you don't have to worry about uh, what it might potentially touch or mess with or change permissions on. Um, you need to use Brew in order to install this on Mac? Um, no, so you can get it directly. They, they have an install script for Mac OS that you can get directly from their website and then you can not have to use brew. It may also be a package in brew. I'm not sure. 
Um, but if you're installing it through Brew, you're really racking up the package managers at that point. Uh, so um, the next time I have to use a Mac for this kind of thing, I will probably not use Brew and uh, just go straight with Nix. Um, anyway, the, the, the cool thing here is that uh, all of these are sim links into the Nix store. Um, so I can, uh, I can, um, I can have, I can have them installed, like installed, uh, for my user and, uh, not installed for a different user because they're going to have different sim links in their dot mix profile slash bin based on what they want, but we can still share the same packages. Uh, and I can also uninstall and reinstall packages without really changing anything. All it's really doing is deleting a symbolic link. So I can do nix n dash e chromium. It gets rid of it. And then uh, if I look in this directory again, oops, dot nix profile bin, chromium is no longer there. Uh, but in actuality, delete all the trash that nothing is using anymore. So nix collect garbage, you can see went and made 460 megabytes of free stuff. I imagine most of that is Chromium and dependencies of Chromium. Um, okay. Um, here's another interesting thing. So, uh, Actually, yeah, you, think, you think they'd uh, repeat that last little bit uh, that you were uh, that you're doing while the uh, live stream was off? Sure. Yeah. Um, the gist of it is that uh, you might actually want to delete a package and not just uninstall it from your view, but leave it in the Nix store. And when that's the case, you just use Nix collect garbage and it will check what are the packages I have that no one has as like in their in their personal like Nix profile. Uh, so if you uninstall a package uh, by default, it'll just leave it in the store because you might want to roll back. But if you uninstall it and then Nix collect garbage, then it'll know, okay, I should actually go and throw this in the real trash and delete the actual file. Um, uh, so that's just another useful mix command. Um, the uh, the um, final thing I wanted to mention is that the mix packages themselves are built in a sandboxed environment. Uh, and you have access to that sandbox for your own project. So you can uh, use what's called mix flakes. Now, this is getting to what to stuff that I'm not super familiar with. Um, but there are Nix flakes, uh, which is basically a way I can I can make a project that um, that and manage the dependencies for my own project uh, as though it were a Nix package, uh, and and then you know package it for Nix, uh, and this allows me to do things like create environments where uh, no resources are accessible except for those that I get through Nix, so I can guarantee that if my project builds, then for sure, all the dependencies are there, and they've for sure been specified uh, like with Nix, and they're not leaking in from my system. And all of the Nix packages are built this way, so you can be reasonably sure that, like, for example, on Arch, every once in a while, I get a package that there's a missing dependency, and I really need to install something else, and it just it slipped through the cracks. That can't happen by design in Nix because of the way they've set up uh, the Nix sandbox. Um, it also means that uh, if I build something, if I build a, uh, a a package from source and you build the same package from source, well, then we end up with exactly the same binary, which is cool because then uh, I don't need to download giant opaque binaries, uh, but then I can still check to make sure that my resulting package uh, matches the, the hash of... Uh, you know, your, your package on your system. Um, yeah, this is, um, this adds a little bit more overhead when you're trying to maintain a package, but uh, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much all I got. One, one very final note is um, you may have noticed that I didn't have to use sudo to uninstall or install any of those packages. You need sudo to set up Nix, but once you have it set up, the Nix daemon uh, is actually doing all the work. 
So um, it has permissions to mess with the Nix store. I don't have those permissions as just, you know, regular Joe user, but I can, when I install packages, I'm just asking the Nix daemon to get the package from a place that's been pre-configured where it knows packages come from. So um, I can install packages without root permission that are visible only to me. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and Does the daemon run as root? Um, I think so. I mean, it, I think it may actually, it may run as its own user. Uh, we can, we can check this. Uh, we can look at what the Nix store is. The Nix store is owned by root. Uh, if I look in here, um, so, uh, you remember if it's user group or group user, I think it's user group, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, there is some kind of permission system going on with this Nix build group, um, but I'm not exactly sure. It does look like the, the Nix daemon runs as root, but it may also just be a member of the Nix build group. I mean, it's, it should be running now, right? Can you just do PS grep or PS uh, yeah, I can, grep? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I could do this. Into grep Nix. Use capital. Into less. Oh. Um, let me zoom out here. Um, yeah, so it's got really long options, uh, some of my things. So this seems to be Brave, which is how I'm running this now. So all of that can be ignored. Here's my grep. Here I is it's... Nick's daemon, dash, dash, daemon, which is running as root. There you go. Runs as it good. seems like that might be a security exposure, having a daemon that's um, running as root, doing all of this stuff with all of these packages that came from other places. So they all come from one trusted source. So ultimately, you're always trusting the people who run your package repositories. And your package manager already runs as root. Um, so I wouldn't say that it is inherently much less secure than running your normal package manager as root. Fair Although point. I would also argue that uh, the more things that run as root, the worse. So uh, it isn't great that it runs as root, I agree. OK, put the, uh, font, uh, the font size back up again. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, a final note, uh, there are other front ends that use the Nix store, too. So. Um, Nix has its own configuration language that's, uh, people are opinionated about it. Um, so if you don't like it, there's also GNU Geeks, spelled G-U-I-X, that basically implements the exact same functionality and uses the Nix store and the set of Nix packages. But uh, instead of programming it with the Nix language uh, to make packages, um, you program it with GNU Guile, which is basically Scheme. Mm -hmm. So if you're more into Lisp, uh, that might be the flavor to go for for you. Um, but it achieves pretty much the same goals. And that's a pretty cool feature, I think, that the, the sort of back end of this whole thing is, uh, is accessible. And you can design alternate front ends to suit your uh, preferences. So yeah, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, there's a whole lot more to this tool, especially with NixOS. You can do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, you can have, you can specify pretty much your entire system configuration in a single config file. You can do things like say, uh, instead of having to write like grub mk config uh, dash o whatever, and then grub install dash dash target equals x86 64 efi dash dash efi directory is this other thing. And you have to remember all these commands every time you want to reinstall your system if you have a distribution that doesn't have a nice installer. Um, well, with Nix, uh, with Nix OS, you basically have this big declarative config file where I just write, OK, it has, it has a bunch of options in the config file. Like, uh, where is your EFI directory? Uh, what uh, is your, like, here are a bunch of grub configuration options. Just set them in the config file. And then you run a single command to just regenerate your entire OS. Uh, so you change your configuration file, and your OS changes to match it. Um, so no more uh, commands to remember. 
you just have one giant config file that specifies your whole system. Uh, and you can take that same config file, move it to another computer, and now you've just duplicated the state of your previous computer. And you can manage your dot files with a, in a similar way with a tool called Home Manager that they also make. Um, I haven't actually, I've played with NixOS, but I wouldn't say I'm comfortable with it. Home Manager, I've never tried, so I can't really say one way or the other whether it's worth it. But um, certainly these are, this is an interesting approach to package management. I haven't seen uh, other systems try. So it's, I think it's pretty cool. So when you do a first time sell, you have to first uh, spend a few hours creating this config file? Well. No. So the, I'm sorry. The very first time you install NixOS, uh, yes, you, you do need to configure it the way you want. But I would say that most distributions, you have to configure things the way you want. Um, it does have a default, you know, a set of defaults in which very few packages are installed and, uh, you know, things are configured the way they think you might want it. Um, so if you're cool with the defaults, you can just leave it as is. Um, otherwise, yeah, you have to spend some time making the config file. But the benefit is that you can take that config file with you to every computer you set up in the future. And um, you only have to change the pieces of it that you actually want to change. Instead of having to dig through menus and find all the settings, they're all exposed to you through this one giant config file. <laughs> Is there an option to have it auto detect most of the settings? I'm sorry? Is there an option to have it uh, like auto detect a uh, uh, set of settings? Hmm, to generate a config file from your current system state? I'm not sure. I, I've i never heard of that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's out there. I know things like Fedora and Ubuntu, they, uh, they basically look at the system and uh, figure out what Sense that you don't have to do a whole lot of uh, customizing. They figure out what. They'll detect what CPU you, uh, you're running. It'll, uh... Oh, so for things like your hardware, um, uh, yeah, you, you. I mean, you specify. Uh, you can specify if you want to install things like microcode that might be specific to your hardware, or um, you know, particular drivers. Um, but. Uh, this, I think this is more for, um, those Those would be exposed as packages. So you would just say that you want those packages. Um, the uh, the NixOS config file is more for things like the configuration of those, uh, you know, of those, maybe I, maybe I have an NVIDIA graphics card, but I want to blacklist the Nuvo driver because I want to actually, I want to make sure I always use the proprietary driver. Maybe I want to blacklist the proprietary driver just in case I accidentally install it and I, I, but I really always want to use Nuvo. Um, those kinds of things you specify in the big config file. So more more things that would already be customizations. Anyway, that's all I've got. So um, happy to answer more questions if I can. Interesting. We, you have some notes you were using uh, for the talk? Because if, if they are, I'd like to put them on our website. Uh, yes, I do have lots of notes. Um, they are here on the laptop next to me. Um, I can give you them, although they aren't, the grammar isn't perfect. There's a lot of sentence fragments. Um, but yeah, I can, I can send them over right now. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. I uh, spent a lot of time trying to get the screen sharing to work on this uh, before the meeting. I had never had it work before. Um, this is a Wayland window manager. Um, uh, and it's always given me problems with screen sharing. But it turns out what I needed to do was this. XDG desktop portal and XDG desktop portal WLR. Both need yeah. to be running in the background. And then yeah. I can share my screen fine. <laughs> yeah, the font's way too small now. I can't read any of that. Sorry. Um, that's because I stopped the process uh, as it was 
uh, being used. So it seems like the screen sharing probably just crashed. <laughs> let me let me try to get this going again. Oops. The the hints on what Wayland needs for screen sharing would be useful things to either put in the chat or send along to Jabber for notes as well. Oh yeah, I actually I actually wrote the two commands at the bottom of the notes just by coincidence that I was already going to send to him. So uh, that works out. <laughs> um, Excellent. Yes. Does the next package manager track configuration files? We were talking about config files at the beginning, and you can install Chromium, use it for 10 minutes, and now you've got a half gigabyte profile folder. Mm -hmm. uh, does Nix know anything about getting rid of that, or do you have to go find it and get rid of it yourself? So Nix, there's another tool that's not the Nix package manager called Home Manager that does track all that stuff. But by default, the Nix package manager does not track all of that stuff. Um, so it's if you use Home Manager, then you can you can track all that through Nix and have like one grand unified <laughs> config. <laughs> uh, but by default, no, it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do that. The uh, the commands also to get the screen sharing to work on Wayland is. Um, it depends on what uh, what desktop environment or window manager you're using. So I'm here. I'm using this is Sway, so it's based on WL roots. So I need XDG desktop portal, portal WLR. But if this were KDE, I would want des XDG desktop portal, portal KDE. And it may be that it would be default enabled on a syst on something as complete as KDE. Uh, and I only have this. It's possible I only have this issue because this is fairly minimal. But previously, I used to just uh, change TTYs into X11 and then share from there. So this is a lot nicer than that. If there are no other questions, I guess we can call it a night. Okay, right. Ben, thank you very much. I was very interested in it. Sure, yeah. yeah. Cool. Ooh. All right. Uh, nice, nice seeing you guys. Um, I guess I'll see you later. <laughs>